Hello, welcome to Trident Talk in our first episode of Under the Sun, where I'm going to be interviewing our co-host, Arish, here about his journey into owning Trident Solar and a little bit about himself and where the solar industry is going. So first, Arish, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me. I don't know why I feel so awkward. I feel like we're on our first date or something, but um, this is cool. If one thing I wanted everybody to know is that Caleb's actually my business partner and one of my best friends. So now being able to do the things that we're talking about is actually a really cool experience. This is a blast. This is surreal. And I feel like I'm going to be really bad at the podcast thing for a little while. But, first episode. But, uh, first you know, episode. I think you're bad at everything. So we're just going to keep showing up. <laughs> and eventually we'll get good at this like like I have with other things. You just got to keep showing up and failing forward. Figure it out. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and your journey into starting Trident and what made you interested in going into business for yourself? Yeah. So um, pretty much I moved to San Antonio in 2009. I was originally born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, a small family, four of us were really, really tight. When my family moved here to San Antonio, we opened up an Indian grocery store in uh, Stone Oak. And uh, at that time, my dad, you know, we couldn't really have any employees. So I was kind of employee number two at the store behind my dad and my sister. So um, kind of had a business understanding and a business work ethic from a pretty young age, not really by choice, but kind of by circumstance. But um, at that time, as a kid, you don't really get to appreciate those kind of things. Looking back now after everything that we've done, everything that I've learned and everything, but it's kind of like something you appreciate, right? And um, yeah, so moved here in 2009 and went to school, Texas A&M. After that, I started working my first job after college, which was being a client advisor at BMW of San Antonio. And that's when I really got into sales and kind of learning how sales works. But it was a really weird situation because I was getting a salary um, and the salary was a great salary, but it wasn't really that same kind of pressure, that same kind of um, sales push that you really want. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we understand like it's now or never. It's kind of this is this is it. So uh, it was comfortable, but the management wasn't something that I was really a big fan of. So um, I left BMW and I got an offer to go to Tesla. Now, when I first started working at Tesla, that's when I, um, that's when I started learning about solar. Should I, should we save this for another one or should I just keep going? No, keep going. Okay. All right. A lot of, I, all of this is like all together. So like, is it all gonna get even, even the mess ups, we're going to keep in there. That way everybody knows that you have to start bad at something. Oh, I thought <laughs> we were going to edit it. We can edit it pieces. All right. We'll edit pieces. But not a lot. <laughs> okay. okay. One, I'll keep it that way. Um, <laughs> For, first time for everything. But um, yeah, so that was a little bit about me, kind of how I got started into business. And so it sounds like working with your father at the grocery store was a big part of your life. Could you tell me what you think your biggest takeaways of having that upbringing were? Yeah, um, shit gets hard sometimes as long as you stick with your family, as long as you have a belief and as long as y'all are working towards something, everything kind of figures it out at the end. I mean, it wasn't easy at the beginning. There wasn't It wasn't by choice, right? That um, I was working at the grocery store, but it taught me a lot about how people are. I was 13, 14 years old negotiating with 40, 50 year old Indian aunties about 50 cents, 75 cents on produce. It builds a lot of character. So, um, yeah, I think just from early on, I got to understand, you know, customer service and hard work, kind of little, little things that you really wouldn't pick up until you go to college, right? Or until you start working. So that was one big advantage that I saw. And you mentioned something about, you know, sticking together with family being a real core takeaway from you. You know, what, what do you think is one of the most valuable things your family has given you to make you successful in this world? Specifically in solar or just in... Just in general. Just like in what, general. What do you think may, your family has given to you that has contributed to your sex? Whether it's a part of your personal development support. or your... Um, I think support, but also just kind of an understanding that shit's been hard. If I can do it, you can do it too. I mean, my dad came to this country, just like every other immigrant dad, with a couple hundred bucks in his pocket, no really a plan, but just had the visa, had a opportunity to come here and make a better life and looking back on that that's kind of crazy that someone can just kind of pick up shop no cell phones no nothing and just come to a new country and figure it out right so anytime I feel like sad or upset I just kind of remember it's been a lot worse for somebody that I know really well and uh it's kind of something that keeps you going and then at the end of the day they work really hard and a lot of this is going to be helping to kind of make sure that they are appreciated their hard work doesn't go unappreciated and making sure that they are taken care of right so um, I think just resiliency is something that I learned from that, from those experiences with my dad. I can say, I know talking about yourself has got to be difficult, right? And, and you might be a little nervous to keep going on that, but yeah. I think your story will touch a lot of people and, yeah. and make it clear that no matter what your upbringing is or what you've been through, like there's an opportunity 
be successful. And I think one of the best things about your story uh, that you've told me off of the podcast is that you're really not a victim to your circumstances. You, you take ownership of your life and the things that have happened. Yeah. Do you think a lot of your upbringing was a part of that? Yeah. I mean, we had some tough times living in Atlanta, Georgia in the beginning. And I think seeing my dad just hundred percent take ownership for that and not really moping around and kind of figuring out what his next play is. Cause I mean, this was something that he'd be working towards for 10 years and it kind of just collapsed. And at that point you have an option of whether you're going to be sad or run away or you're going to work towards the next thing. Right. So when that happened, that's when, you know, a lot of the grocery store idea kind of came into play and him kind of figuring out like, okay, this is not going to work. I just got to have a different approach and try something else. Right. No matter what life throws at you, you just got to kind of figure it out and go with it. Um, and I think that's for anybody. It doesn't have to be a lot of immigrant kids. I know for sure feel this because a lot of their parents are working a lot of, I don't want to say necessarily blue collar jobs, but working in the gas station, working in a grocery store, driving to Houston to pick up, you know, groceries and loads and all these things. It, it takes a toll on somebody. Right. And, uh, they've seen that part in their parents as well too. And me seeing it, it's like, okay, I want to work hard now. I want to figure out all my things now. So that way, you know, number one, my kids aren't seeing me in this situation. Um, that's like a big thing for me, even though they're not here yet, but just, I don't want them to feel that same feeling that I had. And I don't want them to be working at the grocery store at 12, 13 years old, you know, if they don't have to, even though it did build character. So I don't know, it kind of goes both ways, right? I think that's a crazy thing. Like, I think one of the things that contributed to my success at a younger age has been greatly put on the fact that I've worked my whole life. You know, yeah. I started knocking doors when I was like 12, mowing yards. And I wouldn't crazy. wish that on... Knocking doors since 12 years old. I mean, I, like... I wouldn't wish anybody to have to like have a circumstance in which they felt at, at 12 or 13 or 14 that you had to go out and start making your own income in some sort of way, right? But in the same hand, because I've had that experience, it has translated to the rest of my life. Like going to sales, for example... Most people are really worried about that commission lifestyle, yeah. Um, especially if you grew up with some sort of salary or you were taught to get a good job so you have that guaranteed income. And guaranteed income is- it's exactly what all of us are taught. Amazing. Don't get me wrong. I, I personally feel that a salary is like the most potent drug in the world because once you have it, it's really hard to golden chase handcuffs. anything else. Exactly. The golden handcuffs. Um, that being said, how are we going to push that? onto our children one day so they have some sort of adversity? That's a good question, honestly. I mean, I want them to be comfortable, but at the same time, it, there's a lot of character building events that's happened both in my dad's life, both in my life, and... We'll find it. We'll, we'll, we'll find out in a little bit. You know, we'll, we got a couple of, we got a little bit of time. We got a few we years, right? Before the meetings run around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to figure, we got to get a little bit of time for that. But and the thing, the main thing is, is that recognizing it, and then... You see a lot of kids that who come from really wealthy parents that still have a really good work ethic just because they have something in them that motivates them and drives them. And if you're able to instill that, that's huge. That's like amazing. But um, I feel like a lot of people get comfortable and that's why their kids don't really have that same um, fire in them just because they gave them that comfortability, right? So um, we're getting a little bit ahead. I haven't really thought about all the different yeah, of course, right? parenting tips. I, I got to figure that all that <laughs> out later, bro. It, right? Yeah. Well, but... you don't have kids yet, so you don't have to figure it out now. There we go. I have but... one kid right now, two kids right now, <laughs> Trident Roofing, Trident Solar. So <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, I think one of the most important things is just being coachable. I, I think yeah. one of the things that first attracted me to having a partnership with you is your openness to continued education. Do you think that's played a role in you going through entrepreneurship? Uh, yes, I think because I never really had a passion for learning until I started the business itself. And that's when it was like, okay, I'm not learning because I have to learn. I'm learning because I want to learn. And I think that's a huge, huge perspective shift if anybody has, um, in this kind of industry, right. Or in this kind of business. But back when you're in school, back when you're in college and everything, you're learning stuff because maybe you do want to learn it or maybe you are passionate about it. But a lot of times it's because you're trying to get a good test score, you're trying to get, that job or trying to go into this career field, whatever the case is, right? And I never really had the passion or the happiness I got from learning in those kind of situations than I did when I was kind of self-teaching myself about solar, self-teaching myself about how do I run a business? How do I start a partnership? How do I, you know, start an L do any of these things, right? And I think because I knew that that learning is going to be something that I can ingrain and also refer back to in 10, 15 years, I think that's why it was such a big um, reason. I think that's why it's like a big part of who I am today is just continue learning and being able to be coachable. And I also think if I have those traits, people that I will attract will also have those traits, right? So I think it goes both ways. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, 
I appreciate you sharing so much about yourself, which kind of brings me to the next point. What inspired you to start Trident Solar? So Trident Solar was, it was a very interesting way that it got started. Um, I learned about everything solar. I learned at least 10, 20% of my knowledge in solar about the industry um, at Tesla. And I was working as the solar division. I was working in the solar division at Tesla. And pretty much what I realized there was there's a huge opportunity. Tesla's doing it extremely incorrectly just because of all the customer service reviews that we were getting and everything. And it didn't make me feel good. But um, we, I just saw a lot of opportunity there. Um, specifically, my own family got solar back in 2018. And it really felt like a full circle moment for me to start my own business for that reason. 2017, my dad needed to get a new roof. And when he wanted to get a new roof, he combined it with the installation of our solar panels on our house. The reason he did that was because he found out about the federal tax credit. Being a business owner that he is, he has to pay taxes at the end of the year, right? So um, pretty much what we did was we took that federal tax credit money from both the cost of the roof and the cost of solar, and we used that to pay for my sister and I's college tuition. And I think that's a big, big deal for someone because all our immigrant parents really dream of is kind of sending their kids to college, being able to provide for them, making sure that they get, you know, the career that you work so hard for. And then you can kind of take a little bit of rest. It's like Thanos with a snap after they graduate, right? So um, that's kind of like what the idea and the approach is, but it was a little bit different in my situation. Obviously it wasn't, you know, just get that comfortable job right afterwards and start the salary. It was more just, um, get that. Oh, going back to how I got into Trident Solar, right? So, uh, creating that business after leaving Tesla, it was a little bit hard because I had a mentorship kind of thing. It's someone that's really well known in the industry as someone not to work with, but as a someone that's, you know, like a virgin to the industry, if you will, that's kind of coming in very, very new. Um, it's hard to kind of gauge who are the people you want to trust. And, and that's a huge thing in blue collar in general, right? But these are all things you learn. And I'm glad I learned it at a young age rather than, you know, a lot later on in the business. But um, it started off super negatively. We had a lot of other things going on at that time. So the, be the beginning of the business was a little bit of a mess. But part of that self-education that we spoke about was continuing at it, kind of figuring it out if it's not working, seeing what doesn't work, where you messed up and making sure you don't do that again. It was a lot of trial and error. And it, it, I wish we could expedite it, but we're here right now, a year and a half later, and I'm a lot more confident than I was when I was first starting the business. And uh, yeah, it's just, I'm a huge believer in the product. I'm a huge believer in the industry and I love what I do. So this was kind of no brainer to me. Sounds like a couple things lined up that made yeah. sense, and you're yeah. just like solar's the way. Have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah. That that I could I I can attest for a thousand percent. Just seeing my dad um, back when he was running the grocery store in San Antonio, I, freshman year of college, I remember calling him. I think the third or fourth week and telling him, "Hey, I found this perfect location. We can open up a grocery store here. We'll buy the items in bulk. It'll be a lot cheaper for both locations. I'll bring it back to the college station. Like I'll help you. We'll grow this thing out." And I wanted to franchise the grocery store. Um, and that was just built in from excitement and kind of understanding the business from working there in high school and everything. But, uh, at that time he just didn't have the energy for it. You know, he'd work his ass off and he was tired and he was just kind of like, focus on your studies. You let me handle work and everything. And that didn't sit right with me. You know, I didn't want to focus on my studies. I didn't want to go the corporate route. I wanted to grow the business. And if that's not what I'm going to do, then I'm going to grow my own business. So entrepreneurship was always something that was like, I guess, instilled in me or something that was like an itch in me that I wanted to find out or figure out. So while you were going to college, do you think anything you learned there really contributed or helped yeah. your success so far? Yeah. Um, I think I learned a lot of people skills in college, to be honest. I just being able to start a conversation out of thin air, it's a lot harder than some people expect. Um, and I'm not saying that's like a, a huge skill. I think that's a skill that anybody acquired. But for me, it happened when I was in college, just from being in different organizations, kind of being in a new environment that wasn't, you know, San Antonio or anything like that. So I think I kind of developed a lot of myself throughout college, if that makes sense. I did a lot of international traveling as well, which you learn a lot of things about other places, yes, but you also learn a lot of things about yourself and about people as well when you go visit and travel and stuff. So I think the main things I could say thank you to college for is kind of developing my communication skills, develop, developing um, people skills, networking skills, stuff like that. But in terms of anything legitimate, I wouldn't really... Not for this industry, at least. I don't learn anything about solar when it comes to college. Not one thing. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. I think that's like a million dollar question for a lot of entrepreneurs is, is the degree worth it or not? I think it just depends on who you are and where you're at in your life. And what you want to do too. Yeah. I mean, I got the degree to make my parents happy. That's every single brown kid you're going to talk to is pretty much going to give you a similar answer or at least the entrepreneur ones. But yeah, the degree was always to make my parents happy. To go to college was always to make my parents happy and to get a job until I figure out what I want to do afterwards. It just happened to be a lot sooner than I had expected after graduating. So 
Yeah. Well, better late than ever. Yeah. Or better yeah. sooner than never. What's the structure of Trident now? Are you like a dealer? You know, what's yeah. the process there? So at the moment right now, we are a dealer. Um, it's tough to be a dealer in the city of San Antonio just because of the regulations, because of all of the governance. It's a city, it's a government owned entity, CPS. So it's a little bit tough being a dealer because we want to have that direct conversation, direct communication with the uh, utility, but because we can't do that right now, we are a dealer and we're looking to transition into becoming a general contractor installer. Um, it takes a lot of time. We're looking to grow the team out. I'm still hiring people, trying to figure out some stuff, but um, the goal within the next six to 12 months is definitely to become an EPC or to become an installer and just kind of grow our vertically uh, integrated team from there. And what do you think being an installer does for your customer? Um, I think we're able to have a lot clearer communication with our clients because because we're a third party right now it's we can always we can only control so much we can only say so much but given the experiences that i've had in the industry given the knowledge that i now have in the industry too i know which direction way i want to steer the boat when it comes to my installations and talking to the utility and the timelines and everything so um it may be a struggle the first year after becoming an epc that's kind of the i mean everyone struggles if you don't struggle it's you know it's Really rare, but... Are you doing something hard? You're probably, yeah, we're really doing something hard. But um, yeah, the, pl the plan right now is just to grow out all the, the key members we need to become an EPC, master electrician, TDLR, all these things. But after that, it's going to be to grow out the sales team, become a fully vertically integrated company where we're doing our own installs. Um, and we're actually more hands-on on the operational side of things rather than just on the sales and marketing side of things. And then what's the real big benefit of the dealer versus being a installer? You know, Being an installer has a lot more liability attached to it. It has a lot more risk, a lot more headache, a lot more moving parts. Um, it's very much like having a roofing company, right, where you're kind of controlling all the back end things of everything. But being a dealer, at the end, on the other hand, it's a uh, it's a lot more lucrative for what you're putting in versus what you're getting out, right? Because the dealers are making the high commissions right now, depending on how you sell your stuff. Um, it's it makes a lot of sense to become a dealer. There's no liability. You don't have to get any kind of specific licensing or contracting or anything like that. And your main role is just to bring in revenue for your EPC, your installer, and that's to um, get as many customers and as many appointments and sales as possible. And while that's still like the focus, that should be the focus for every company, and that's our focus for us, um, we just want to have a little bit more control on the operational side of things on the back end based off of previous experiences. So, so. did you choose to go and become an installer because you see the direction the industry is going maybe over the next five, 10 years? I think the dealer model is going to die out in the next five to 10 years. I think there's going to be a lot of partnerships that are kind of coming up in the next five to 10 years between dealers and installers because installers are really good at one thing and dealers are really good at the other thing, right? Um, we don't know what we're really good at yet. We're going to figure that out. We've been okay on the sales and marketing side of things and on the operation side of things. I think we'll be all right too. But um, yeah, the I think the dealer model is kind of going away and I think the goal should be to become vertically integrated. Plus you own all the contracts at the end of the day, right? Your company is the one that's getting the top line revenue for these company for these contracts. And you have the direct hand, you're taking liability and ownership for everything that you're preaching, right? I mean, that's kind of, we, we're not afraid to become an EPC because we want to be able to give a better experiences than other EPCs we're giving right now, right? Um, and if we start in San Antonio, we can be locally registered. We can be everything like that, connected with CPS and then kind of grow out from there. That's the... Uh, that's the plan right now. At least so if you had to start over thing. yesterday, would you just went straight installer model? Or? I, no, no. If I had to start over yesterday, I probably still wouldn't go straight because being a dealer for the past year and a half, two years, I learned about not just one or two installers, but about five, 10 different installers. I got to see how all their back backend operations work. I got to see like what their structures are, what their SOPs are, what their... Everything that I didn't know I needed, I learned from being a broker, pretty much, right? Just being able to have backend access and being able to see everything um, from some of the best companies in Texas. So I'm really glad that we went that route just because without that education, we wouldn't be able to have a vision kind of the way we want to proceed when it comes to the install route. Um, it's it's really cool to be able to see all the great things that other companies are doing and then also, and then wanting to you know implement that and kind of have that in the company, but also seeing all the bad things and all the things that they aren't doing so well and being able to avoid that. So I think that learning curve that a lot of people have, I was blessed to kind of with good people, good help and good questions. And also just being able to see everything from the back and I've been able to kind of expedite that a little bit, but I definitely wouldn't go EPC first. I think dealer is definitely the first route that everybody should go. Okay. And where do you see the, the wholesaler industry going over the next five to 10 years? 
So San Antonio specifically, or actually the solar industry specifically, is going to be booming in the next five to ten years. We haven't reached any of the uh, projections or market penetration that people think that we've reached. I know people are maybe thinking, oh, solar is dead. Everyone that wanted it already got it. But that's not the case at all because of a couple of things, right? Um, EV adoption is going up like crazy. The numbers on EV adoption is going up more and more. And when people are getting EVs, they need something to charge those EVs. You're getting that electricity from your house, right? Hopefully you're generating your own with solar, but all the electricity needs to be either generated or uh, called for, right? So that's one of the big things. Another big thing is that there's rate increases coming left and right. Um, the Henry Hub, which is the energy gas index, is showing a huge increase in uh, natural gas prices in 2025 after summertime. So right now the goal is really to prepare, build the brand out, kind of have the name out there, help the clients that are interested in everything. But it's going to be more of a demand rather than a, you know, going out and kind of sourcing your own deals and everything in 2025 just because of utility companies having to rate, increase their rates with natural gas going up. San Antonio specifically, 2024, we have a minimum 5.5% increase. 2026, we have a minimum 5% increase. So you're looking at 11% increase as a placeholder from two in rate increases that are coming. And people are starting to realize that it's starting to take effect. I mean, you go outside, it's 112 degrees outside. It's going to be 110, 107, 108 all week this week. It's getting hotter and hotter. And when it's hotter, people use more electricity. When you use more electricity, you're paying a lot more for electricity, right? So, and the Texas grid is just known for being super resilient. The Texas right? grid doesn't even get me started. <laughs> We're going to need a whole different podcast episode for the Texas grid, man, because I have a lot of things I got to tell ERCOT, bro. That's public enemy number one. And people don't realize that the grid is literally made up of aluminum foil and fucking toothpicks. It's really not stable at all. Um, it was built in the 1940s, 1950s. It was supposed to have a 30 year lifespan. <laughs> We're past that already. So. Um, a lot of the, a lot of things that's happening right now is called grid hardening. What grid hardening does is you're putting up metal poles to replace these wooden poles. They last a lot longer. They're twice the life expectancy of these wooden poles. They also cost a shit ton of money. Like, where do you think we're getting all that money from? It's either taxpayers and taxes are going to go up or it's rate increases that are going to go up and the utility has to pay for them. Um, so the power grid is awful. Uh, the energy sector in general got deregulated in the 1990s and that's when everything kind of went to shit, honestly. It's funny because everybody in solar talks about this one quote and it's from Warren Buffett and he's talking about the, the the deregulation of energy is going to be the biggest transfer of wealth in history. He said that quote in 1992, not in any, like he's not talking about solar, he's talking about energy becoming a private, uh, a private equity company or becoming a private sector, right? So it's insane to me to think that something that's the most crucial thing in the entire world, which is America's power infrastructure is hanging together by two like by gum and threads it's honestly it's so the power grid definitely has a lot of work to do we're going to need a lot more stability and power generation from individual homes and that's where solar and batteries come in so we're in a really good time to get into this industry and also to get it on your home or on your uh on your business or whatever the case is so it sounds like ev adoption is a big contributor to why Huge. solar is going to get adopted over the next five to ten years it also sounds like rate increases are going to be pretty consistent in our market, at least San Antonio, you think that's going to be the same across the board? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody already is seeing rate increases everywhere. Um, a lot of places. Okay. So a lot of the energy rates came down here in 2023 because 2021 and 2022, we saw massive rate increases. That was from both COVID and from the Ukraine and Russia war. They can't just keep raising the rates every day. Otherwise we're going to have a riot when people's mortgages are looking like their energy bills. Right. So, or when people's energy bills are looking like their mortgages. Right. So, um, yeah, so I think nationwide there's going to be rate increases coming, and that's 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 history. Over the last twenty years, rate increases have gone up over a hundred percent. So if I would have told you back in two thousand two thousand three, or if I was talking to your dad in two thousand three, and I told him your fifty dollar energy bill is going to be a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars now, he would have been like, "Hell no, Arish, get out of here." You're whatever. crazy. It's not. You're crazy. Not exactly. So um, it's insane. I mean, we were paying four hundred dollars at our house before we went solar in twenty seventeen. That was a huge indicator of why we went solar, but. Someone that's paying $300 now, they're going to be paying $400 in the next three to five years. That's just kind of how history goes, right? Um, always rate increases, barely any rate decreases ever. So so do you um, see any other reason, any other changes or things going on in the industry over the next five, 10 years outside of EV adoption, outside of yeah, rate increases? Yeah, planet's just getting fucking hotter. I mean, we're having longer winters and when it's cold and when there's snowstorms happening in Texas and Texas's power grid, as we both know, is not applicable or not... Yeah. There's no capacity on the Texas power grid to handle the snowstorm yeah, like that. I've, I've lost power for three days at it's, one point. It was brutal. I mean, at the point where people were trying to 
people were losing their lives because they didn't have any other option to go into their garage and turn the car on, but they were leaving the garage for clothes. And it was a sad story, but it's because we don't account for these things. And how are we supposed to account for these things? Who in Texas, if I would have asked you in 2003, in 20 years is going to snow three years in a row in Texas, what would you have told me? I would have told you maybe, but I would have definitely not guessed that you have six inches of snow and freezing rain three days in a row that just completely demolishes your power for three days. So I when mean, it comes to weather, I think weather is a huge indicator on the power grid itself. A lot of the issues that we're seeing with the power grid are happening from um, weather index and with things that are happening in the weather itself, right? So you'll go outside and you're looking at the billboards. It's literally saying, conserve your energy. CPS is pleading its clients right now, conserve your energy, keep your house at 80 degrees when it's 112 degrees outside. It's so funny you say that. I have gotten a call every day for the last 15 days or so with CPS calling like, hey man, can you reduce the, can you turn up the thermostat between three and seven? It's a peak energy day. Every day it's a peak energy day. We keep the house at 72, we paid. 68 bucks in electricity last month. That's that solar, right? That's, so, that's what I'm saying. So that's a really good segue to my next question is if if homeowners are considering doing something about their electric bill, why would they choose solar now? Especially if you live in San Antonio. Well, the main thing is because for a couple of reasons. It's been two summers now, at least the two summers that I've been in this industry where people are saying, you know, oh, maybe I'll wait till the next summer. And then the same people are calling me now saying, hey, we should have gotten it done a lot sooner. The sooner you get it, the sooner you're working towards paying off your solar. So the way solar actually works is if you're financing it, there's no return on investment. It's an instant rate of return, right? Because you're replacing your electric bill and you're swapping it out with the payment for the same for the same purpose. So um, it's usually financed just like any other product or just like any other thing. It's a, it's a finance thing. And when you're financing solar, it's usually a lot longer term. So the sooner you start paying it, the sooner you start paying it off, plus you have fixed payments. So if you know you're paying $400, $500 in the summertime and you're only paying 100, 200 bucks in the wintertime, you could be paying a flat rate of $300. So there's no necessary adjustments well, or anything on, like Rich. that. What's I don't up? need another bill. You don't need another bill. You're replacing your other bill. Okay, so explain yeah. to me how that works because I, I think that's the biggest question many homeowners have is like, I don't want to finance another thing. I don't want to have another bill. Absolutely. I mean, I got enough money flowing out every month. The last thing I want to do is finance something that costs the same as a, a good sedan and put that on my roof. Like, what's the real benefit to me? Can you tell me how I'm replacing the bill? So your truck outside, what kind of truck is it? Uh, it's 2020 Silverado. 2020 Silverado. Um, and are you financing it or are you leasing it? It's financed. So why did you finance it instead of lease it? Uh, I financed it because of the amount of miles I put on a vehicle. Financed it because of the amount of miles you put on a vehicle. Um, so a lease would have cost more. A lease would have cost way more. Way, way more. So if you're able to, let's say, have a flat rate and own your power on your house, and you're financing it, you're replacing your lease, which is your electric bill with CPS, which your finance payment, which is your loan to your solar. So same reason why you finance your cars, you get a mortgage on your house, you want to have the ownership. And it's because you're not throwing your money into a thermos or into a furnace, uh, into a fireplace or anything like that, right? You're taking a $200 electricity payment to CPS and you're replacing it with a $200 solar payment. The $200 is still going to be the same regardless of what it is. It's just going towards the panels and the equipment and that way you're owning your power so once the system is paid off you're generating your electricity for free if i would have told you you can have a gas pump at your house for a dollar fifty a gallon and you're financing it but you can have it at that rate at that price would you would you be interested in looking into it yeah man with I today's mean, gas prices with today's gas prices you would have saved me a ton of money so in 10 years if people are looking back and they're saying okay my cost for electricity has gone up 20 30 40 percent and if you're getting solar now you're locking it in at that price that it is today that's kind of the essential idea behind getting the bill swap when it comes to having your electric payment and then having your uh solar payment so it sounds like as energy goes up solar panels are going to go up in cost as well the yes and no there's a lot a lot of benefits right now in solar um number one thing in solar that's the biggest eye catcher is a new ira we're still waiting on the guidelines from that from the government but there's $460 billion or so invested into the IRA, into clean energy, meaning that all what these- What does IRA mean? IRA means Inflation Reduction Act, right? So the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, they're, the, the government is basically giving out a lot of money to homeowners, to business owners, to people in America to start adding in uh, clean energy into their lives or into their homes, into their businesses. And how are they doing that? They're doing that with the federal tax credit. That's the number one way, right? So if we're looking at residential, 
the number one subsidy right now is the federal tax credit, which is a 30% federal tax credit on the cost of the solar, uh, the solar panels, the solar system, and you're getting that back on your federal income taxes, right? So let's say $30,000 system, 30% federal tax credit, around $10,000 as a tax credit, right? If you owe $10,000 to the IRS the next year, you're going to be it's basically like a, a coupon. It saves in your pocket type of thing. Mm. So you're not getting a rebate. It's not one of those things you say like, oh, you can go solar for completely free and government will pay you to go solar. Mm-hmm. Like those ads you see on Facebook. I I hate that it's a deregulated industry for that reason because I hate the scumbags that we have. But um, I think that's a lot of... That's a lot of a any lot construction, of any, it's right? It's like any industry. I mean, there's bad restaurants. There's there's bad contractors. There's bad, there's bad doctors. Like I think anywhere you go, there are bad actors. And unfortunately, I think today... Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, everybody has a microphone. I mean, for example, we're sitting here on a microphone and we're going to put this on YouTube and it gets however many views it gets. But the point is, is no matter who you are, you have a platform in which to speak on. And right. I think that does that does get some homeowners in sticky situations. I know from personal experience in my industry and in roofing, I mean, we have a lot of guys who will make homeowners complicit in a felony and they're unaware of it. An example of that is like eating deductibles. And in Texas, because of HB 2102, it's completely illegal for a contractor to do any kind of eating, waving, or anything with a deductible. Most homeowners don't know that. I have to do roofs every day, so I know that's a law, right? Yeah. But most people replace their roof once every 20 years. Most people in the course of their lifetime, hopefully you're only involved in this once, maybe twice. On the high side, if you're in a heavily storm-impacted area, you may experience it four or five times. But that's the minority of people. Most people, it's one or twice, once or twice through their whole life, and the laws change massively between yeah. the ten-year gaps of doing it, right? And I think that's one of the bigger issues with everybody having a platform. Is people can get caught up with bad contractors or bad actors in the solar industry. And I think it goes down to a lot of the training and a lot of the leadership that you see in the industries as well, too. Because a big issue, like in our in, in solar, the same thing that you're talking about, it would be. You're going to an elderly person. You're telling them they're going to get this federal tax credit. They're going to get all these things. First of all, that person's not working, so there is no income tax that that person's paying, so they're not going to get that federal tax credit. Second of all, they are not going to be living longer than the duration of the term that you just sold them. So there's a lot of unethical things that you see in the solar industry that I don't like. And for that reason, um, education for training and all these things is a huge part of what we're preaching over here because I don't want people going out there expecting a rebate from Trident Solar for $10,000 because they were promised a 30% rebate, right? So um, it's it, just, it really just goes down to like, number one, where are you getting your information from? Do you trust where you're getting your information from? And then um, how are you relaying that information so nothing gets lost in, uh, in translation? So it sounds like bad actors are a point of contention for you and you, you kind of worry about that. What personal values of yours are you injecting into your company to prevent your staff from doing that or employees from doing that? Um, over communication. I'd rather somebody tell me 10 times how the federal tax credit works before they even go to their first appointment, before they go shadow a door, just because there are certain key things in solar that everybody should know um, before you can even continue on. And I'm sure it's the same thing in roofing as well too, right? So for us, understanding the federal tax credit, understanding uh, shading, irradiance, kind of production, stuff like that, understanding what kind of equipment you're using, the warranties you're selling, how those warranties are applied. And I think the biggest thing that anyone in solar that is a little confused or really just wants to understand everything, the biggest thing you can do is read the agreements. If you read these contracts, these solar agreements, they're all in favor of the customer 100% of the time. They are protecting the client. They are making sure that Everything that we're saying we're doing is actually there. It's all in the paperwork. So if you really just read and understand these agreements, it's so much easier to translate that and to be able to communicate that to clients. And that's a huge part of our training too, is making sure that if you're going to sell this, you're going to understand what the fuck you're selling and how do you sell it and what, what, what are we, what's the, what's the language here? What are we talking about? Right? So I think communication and training is a huge part to prevent that kind of thing. And then I know, that I know that we've talked about some things and the reason why the company name is Trident. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, I can't even take credit for the name. My sister came up with the name Trident. Um, and it's because I texted her saying, I want to do Titan. And Titan was already taken. It's actually one of the biggest nationwide installers. So definitely cannot use Titan Solar. Uh, so she came up with Trident and then she sent the emoji afterwards. And I, th- I like the name right then and there just because we had the emoji. And I was like, yeah, that's cool for branding. You know, I like that. But um, I, th- I think a day goes by and I wanted to give it some meaning. And the best thing that we kind of came up with together was uh, when when you work with Trident or when you go with any of Trident services, there's three things that we're focusing on, right? It's our clients are winning, our team is winning, and our community is winning. And that's kind of the goal. Solar is really the only win, win, win business that's out there where... 
Um, anytime you sell solar, your team is making a good commission. They're happy. They're helping somebody out. Our clients are winning because they're getting a fixed payment. They're saving a lot of money on their electricity and they're locking in their rate. And our planet's winning too. We're taking a lot of the pressure off of you know natural gas and everything like that being our main energy source and kind of becoming independent. And that's a huge thing. So um, our clients win, our team wins, our community wins. That's what Trident stands for. And I think that's a, it's a really good vision and belief to have as a, as a company. So with the world we're living in and the crazy increase in just climate concern, where does solar kind of fall in that conversation? That's a good question, actually. So natural gas um, is a huge play in this kind of ener uh, an energy production that we have today. Coal, natural gas, a lot of the dirty energy, dirty fossil fuels, that you, if you will. Um, I don't, I, a lot of people in solar might, have like an opinion of kind of a hippie we can only go clean energy that's the way to go you know we have to we have to stop now and fuck fuck big oil and everything like that i mean i'd still fuck big oil but i believe that it's a big partnership between the two of them i think that oil and gas have to be partners or have to figure out to work synonymously with clean energy just because it's not one or the other it's how can we minimize and control one while boosting the hell out of and growing the hell out of the other industry right so um, natural gas itself, there's a lot of price increases that are happening. Dem demand is going up. A lot of people don't realize that the demand for electricity goes up year after year, just like the prices do as well. When demand goes up, supply is low. So um, we're going to see a lot of changes when it comes to energy, clean energy, uh, natural gas, and everything within the next three to five years. And getting solar now just helps you have a little bit more freedom and a little bit more control for things, right? So if electricity prices were to skyrocket let's say electricity prices were to double overnight right your hundred dollar bill becomes 200 bucks when when that happens people in solar aren't just going to be like oh yeah that means solar is even more of a no-brainer the industry is kind of they're going to do what any industry does and they're going to say okay the demand for solar has just exponentially skyrocketed so our comp our prices are going to skyrocket as well too so it's not like a lot of people are waiting to get solar because they think that when the energy prices do go up that's when i'll get it because that's when everybody's. That's what everybody's working towards right now. That's when everybody plans to, you know, monetize that industry. And obviously, we want to be able to help as many people as we want. But everyone's playing the long game. Everyone's kind of waiting for that big push. Kind of waiting to get there, and also continuing to push right now so that you know we're stable, but we also have a plan for the future. You know, you said something that is interesting to me. So, one of the things that many people may not know is, first off, I was not a big solar advocate for a long time. I grew up in an oil and gas household. That is, uh, my dad made his living doing that for as long as I can remember. Uh, no longer works in that industry, but I still have a lot of family, right? And one thing I would say to a lot of the people in that industry is understanding that renewable energy sources do not are not going to delete the need for fossil fuels. They're, they're, they are going to have to work hand in hand. It's because, synonymous, yeah. Exactly, because solar energy can only produce so much power, and it's only going to be reliable in you know, prime times where we still have to rely on having natural gas and oil of some sort to produce energy in those yep. off times. And it's more of a matter of just trying to come off complete reliance, right? Yeah, and I think a big part of it is everyone looks at the main thing, which is generation. How are we going to generate this electricity? Mm -hmm. Only, I think, like 25 or 50%, I don't remember what the exact number is, but only 20 or 50% of the number of energy that's generated gets transmit, transmitted to the city and to utilities as well, too. Mm -hmm. Because the main problem that we have right now, the transmission lines are awful. A lot of electricity gets lost, quote-unquote. Yeah, wasn't there like a new superconductor that was just uh, that's what invented or something like that? Well, I mean, supposedly it's been like 10 times now. We the, still haven't had proof of concept, but... The the biggest proof of concept to helping this problem right now would be Tesla's mega pack. So they're creating utility scale uh, battery packs like the Tesla battery pack you have for your residential house, mm -hmm. um, the power wall, they're creating a utility called the mega pack. That is going to help a lot because now you're able to have states and cities generate as much electricity as they want, but they're also able to store that electricity as mm -hmm. well too. Um, you can generate all you want, but if there's no need for it, if it's not in demand time, demand time is usually from 12 o'clock to eight o'clock at night, right? So um, if you're not generating throughout those whole times, it's kind of, you're losing electricity. So it's not just a problem in clean energy, uh, losing electricity. It's a problem in natural gas and oil too. But just being able to like find different different pieces and being able to supplement that into our current infrastructure, that's exactly where it's going to happen in the next five to ten years. Virtual power plants are a huge thing. Microgrids are a huge thing. There's going to be a thing called energy sharing where if I have solar panels on my house and you don't and you don't want to get them, but you still want to use the cheaper electricity that I'm generating, I'll be able to directly sell my electricity to you. So it's going to be 
kind of taking the utilities out of the game. It's going to take a long time just because of all the backings and all the legacy course, and everything that they have. But um, but that's kind of like the projection, and that's what everyone's working towards. That's where all these tech companies are getting really, really, really big uh, fundings from. So The other thing I would say, I mean, for a lot of people who are in oil and gas and use that as a reason for not jumping to solar is to remember that so many things are made out of petroleum products. Like so many, it's not just energy. Yeah, like the cup I'm using, the toy, you know, that your kids play with, anything plastic. The the machines that manufacture these damn panels are using natural gas electricity to get that power to do these things. I mean, like, that's the thing. If people want to be one or the other, they're radicalists and I'm not that. So I believe there's a... It's got to work together. It has to be synonymous. It has to be synonymous. um, And it has to be a control of both of them together. And that's exactly what I've been studying. That's exactly what I've been preaching. I don't think you realize a lot of people that used to work in oil fields are making the transition into becoming technicians for clean energy because these solar farms have a lot of problems just like the oil fields do Mm -hmm. and everything. And there's a lot of money to be made just because the people that are installing these solar farms are making a lot of money. So um, there's a big transition right now happening from oil and gas traditional workers that are going out and doing the typical routes and kind of staying on base and everything, going into clean energy, finding a little bit more freedom, finding a little bit more opportunity and learning something that's going to be a trade for a long time to come here on out, right? So same things that, I mean, in sales, if you're seeing an opportunity as a business for installations, for sales, for operations on the residential solar side, it goes into the same for the power generation side of things as well too. So I want to hit you with one last question from a homeowner's perspective and then kind of talk to you about somebody who's looking to maybe work in the energy field. The last thing I want to ask from a homeowner's perspective is why would I benefit from going to solar? Like in a recap kind of form, like what are some of the biggest takeaways and benefits for me as a homeowner and a consumer? Because, you know, saving the world's great, but ultimately that's not going to affect me very much. I, I, I want to save money. I want to make sure the best investment or value for my home. That's where I'm going to sit at as a homeowner. You know, saving the world's great, but that's not usually my first priority as a homeowner. It's not usually most homeowners' first priority. It's a great thing that we can tag on to going with solar is like, I played my part. That's great. But what would you say are the biggest benefits to going solar? Okay. So I would say the biggest benefits to going solar, I'll give you my top three. Okay. Number one, federal tax credit, 30% federal tax credit on the cost of solar is it's like a coupon for taxes. And can you explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah. So basically when you're getting the 30% federal tax credit on the cost of your solar, it's basically a voucher, a coupon, a gift card that uncle Sam is giving you saying, Hey, Keep that money in your pocket. You're good this year. Or you're good for the next 10 years because that's how long the tax credit works, right? Mm-hmm. Um, let's say I have a $10,000 credit and I have to pay $5,000 in income taxes this year. So for two years, I'm not paying anything in income taxes. I'm using that $5,000 for whatever I want, home improvements, um, business expenses, financial burdens. I mean, there's a lot of tough things happening right now. People could use an extra yeah, five, ten thousand know, dollars crazy. And, yeah, a lot of cash is important right now. Um, and the benefit of being able to get that cash to stay in your pocket while just replacing your electric bill with a payment at a fixed rate. So that's the number two fixed rate after the federal tax credit. Um, One second, before we go to fixed rate. Yeah. So you get the federal tax credit as a homeowner, that's 30%. Are there any other benefits to that? Like, can I, if I have to replace my roof, is there any way I can bundle that in? Yeah, actually. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So that's exactly what we did um, in 2017 when my family got solar. We needed the new roof. We got the solar, combined the cost of both of them, got 30% federal tax credit on both of them. And how does that work? How do you get both? Because it seems like it's mostly for the solar panels, but I do know in cases that you do get it for the roof as well. Could you tell me a little bit about what has to happen for that to occur? Yeah. So now in the IRA, it states that any kind of work being done for the for the uh, application of solar, for the installation of solar can be added as an expense within the loan or within the cost of solar. So basically what you're doing now is, let's say you have a cost for your roof, you're adding it into the solar, right? It's 0% down, meaning that all the loans in solar, you don't have to put any money out of pocket as long as you have decent credit. And that's not like that for the roofing industry, if I'm not mistaken. It's really hard to get zero zero down financing and roofing. So number one, that opens up uh, an option to add your roofing into your solar just because you don't have to pay anything out of pocket. Number two, no deductible being paid out of pocket because it gets into the loan of solar as well too. You're basically combining the cost of your roof with your solar system and then you're subtracting or dividing it by 30%. So how I understand that yeah. is let's, let's say the first thing is uh, as I understand is as a homeowner, if I have to replace my roof, that's probably the best time to get solar because I'm going to get a Absolutely. 30% break on both. Absolutely. So 
let's say we go through the insurance process. My insurance pays for the roof, and now my roof costs fifteen thousand to do. I've got a thirteen thousand dollar check because my deductible is two grand. Mm -hmm. And you said something about like you don't have to pay the deductible out of pocket. It's not because you're changing the cost of the roof. It's because you're taking the fifteen thousand dollar roof and you're putting Rolling it with it say, a the twenty thousand dollar solar. You've got a thirty five thousand dollar loan now. And now I've got $13,000 I can pay on credit card debt or pay for groceries with crazy inflation exactly. we have, right? So exactly. it sounds like just when you are when you know you have to get a roof, the best time to make that investment is to also go into solar because now you're getting 30% on the 15000 and 30% on the twenty. So what's the average life of a roof, you would say? Um, it really depends on the market you're okay. in. Uh, let's say San Antonio. Let's say San Antonio. So in San Antonio, if you have your standard 20-year shingle because of the excessive heat we have here, those typically last anywhere from 15 to 17 years just because of that. 15 to 17. Yeah. And then if you have a 30-year shingle, those are going to last anywhere from you know, 23 to 27 years usually. So let's say 15 to 17. Let's, let's hold on to that for a second, right? Let's say we're installing a solar system on a roof that has a 10-year-old roof on it. It may be in great condition, but it's a 10-year-old roof. And knowing mm -hmm. the life of a roof being 15 to 17 years, what we would do is we would advise getting a new roof with your solar system because in five to seven years, if you know you're going to be replacing your roof, it is a hassle. I mean, you're putting up the system, these panels on your roof. You're going to have to take them off to replace your solar. It's not only a hassle, it's very expensive. It's expensive. I mean, I, and if I've your insurance is not covering resets. it, exactly. It's like it Detach can go anywhere reset. from five grand to 10 or 13, depending on how many you have up there. But I've never seen it less than five. So knowing that, that's a big reason why we push roof and solar together because of all the financial reasons. Yes, but because the number one thing is you're protecting your investment. Um, all the warranties that we have for our systems and our panels and equipment and workmanship are all 25 years. So the idea is to put on a new roof with solar and then have the warranties stay those 25 years without having any work to be done on the roof because we were able to add a new lifeline for the roof as well as add the solar system on there as well too. Um, and at the same time, it's kind of like adding a case on your phone, right? You have your, your roof, you have, which is your phone without a case on it. You're adding solar panels on it. It's withstanding, it's, first of all, it's absorbing all the heat because of these black on black panels. Um, if there's any hail damage coming, it's going directly onto the panels. Hail damage is covered under your insurance um, for your solar panels. It's not under the warranty, but it's under your insurance. So Same thing for most roofs. Same thing with most roofs, right? So. We're able to identify and work with insurance. Because of your experience, because of all the things that we have, we're able to work with insurance companies on the solar side of things with the new roof. And that's kind of the um, the route, the first route that I would that we would take, right? Just to see how we can help the homeowners out. But regardless of that, protecting your investment, adding in the cost for everything, and um, rolling in the cost all into one loan is a huge thing too. Nothing out of pocket. There's a bunch of different little, little benefits. My last question about 30% tax credits. Yeah. Let's say I'm an investor and I own commercial property. Is it the same 30% there? Is there a difference? So it typically comes out to a little bit over 50%, maybe even more. Um, at, you for sure have the 30% federal tax credit, which can be applied towards businesses getting solar now too. On top of that, for the year 2023, the, the maker's depreciation mark is at 80%. So now you're taking the entire cost of the system and you're depreciating it within its first year by 80%, and that's coming as a federal tax credit as well too. Or that's going towards your tax credit as well too. So now you have the 30% plus another 20%, that's around 50% in savings. Depending on where your business is located, depending if you're in a rural area or an urban area, there's a lot of different uh, dependents as well too. But 50%, I would say, is like the bare minimum that businesses are getting to go solar right now. I think it's a so, lot more depending on where you are and depending on what subsidies that we can find for you within the IRA. So it sounds like if I own commercial real estate, it's kind of like a no-brainer. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you own commercial real estate, your business is definitely paying some sort of taxes, I'm assuming. Um, so <laughs> no it would way. be, uh, uh, depending on your accountant, right? But, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a no-brainer for them just because you're only you're getting such a huge tax break for replacing your electricity bill. Um, and because of the experiences that we've had, we have financing available on commercial loans for 15 to 20 years too at decent rates. And we have, you know, those partnerships available with these uh, financing companies. So um, it really is just kind of finding the pain point, seeing if we can make it a thing. A big thing that I've ran into is it's hard to install. It's a lot harder to install commercial and solar than it is to install residential. Like that's when well, just anything though. That's yeah. I mean, with commercial any, work across the board, exactly. whether you're doing roofing, HVAC windows, whatever it is, there's always more steps, right? I think I think the communication with clients is a lot easier when you're doing business to business rather than doing business to consumer. That's but, fair. Right? With anything else. But um, a big issue is that a lot of clients maybe just have a really, really high electricity bill and not enough roof space to get solar. That's something that a lot of people have to think about, right? Um, gas stations, for example. You would think with the canopy, with the, the store itself, we'd be able to offset that electricity. But because they're using so much from their coolers, from their 
um, lights from being open sometimes 24 hours in a day, they're using a lot, a lot of electricity. And to be able to even offset 50% of that, I would say is a huge success because at least 50% of their cost is a fixed rate. They're paying off 50% of it. It's adding value to the property as well too. So um, yeah, just everything's very situation by situation. And we do our best to make sure that on the asset management side, on the financial side of things, that we have all the tax credits lined up. We have all the subsidies lined up. We have the right uh, manufacturers, the right installers, equipment, everything like that ready to go, right? So I just kind of um, so if plug I'm, and play. So if I'm a homeowner or an investor, mm -hmm. it sounds like the 30%, the tax credit just in general is one of the big takeaways. And you were going into your top three. Tax credit was number one. Number two was fixed rates. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so fixed rate is, let's say, um, it's... One thing about electricity is not only are you wasting that money when you're paying it, you don't know how much you're paying every single month. Not everybody is as conscious of their electricity usage. I mean, if you grew up in an immigrant family, your dad yelled at you 1,000%, turn the lights off, electricity doesn't grow on trees or whatever the case is. Your dad, is, Are you paying the electric bill when I'm 12 years old telling me that when I left my closet light on and stuff? So um, it's, a, it's always been a huge thing, but a lot of people aren't built that way and a lot of people just kind of overlook it. Um, and for those people, I think it's the most beneficial, right? It's kind of like, okay, now I don't really have a choice. When I have a fixed rate, especially in a time of a recession where $100 is, can go a long ways for some families, right? $100 can go towards groceries, can go towards back to school supplies, can go towards anything right now. And if I have a fixed payment of $300 a month, I know that's not going up. But in the summertime, my bill is four or $500 and I'm not budgeting for it. I'm not accounting for it. That can really put a lot of people behind or put a lot of people in some sticky situations. So um, being able to know exactly what you're paying every single month before you're paying it, before you're using it, as long as you're within your generation and everything, that helps a lot of people out. So here's the pushback I've heard. Okay. Um, and, and I think there's a reasonable explanation for it, but I'm, I'm curious what your perspective is. When people say there's a fixed rate, I've heard homeowners say, well, I, told, I was told I was going to get a fixed rate, but I'm still paying the solar and $70 a month. Can you explain exactly how that happens? That happens because people don't explain it correctly. That happens because there's not enough space on your roof or you have some kind of shading on your roof to where we're not able to offset more than 100% of the electricity that you're using. The goal for every single home, ideally for me, would be, okay, your home is using 1,000 kilowatt hours. We're putting 1,200 kilowatt hours worth of solar production on your roof, right? That way you have a little bit of a buffer in case you start increasing your energy, which like every single person, every single person always increases their energy demand year after year, right? So we want to have a little bit of a buffer, a little bit of a safe space, but let's say someone has that 80% and you're right, they're, you know, having a fixed payment for 200, $300 and then they still have to pay 60, 70 bucks on the side. And they're like, Hey, that's not, you know, what I heard what happens when you go solar. Mm -hmm. In that situation, I agree with them. It's not as ideal. But if I'm still able to own 80% of something rather than own 100% of something, that's still 80% of something that I'm owning versus 80% of money that I'm wasting. Right? So, yeah, no, I, I agree. Having yeah. the fixed rate is great. You're still yeah. you're offsetting, say, 80% of your usage. I just think there's a lot of confusion from, you know, I think just explaining earlier. it correctly. I think being able to understand what the concern is. And I think that goes on both people. That goes on the client being able to explain like, hey, I don't know why I'm getting this bill or anything. I think for us, we kind of go through the... Proposal, we put specifically how much your monthly payment with your loan is going to be versus how much your monthly payment with CPS is going to be afterwards. And if anyone's telling you zero, they're lying for sure because you have to have a generation, uh, a connection fee with CPS. It's $10 just to be connected to the grid every single month. So mm -hmm. that we can't offset. We can't do anything about that. Yeah. Um, so we're always honest about it in our proposals. We're explaining how solar works in terms of we're not really 100% replacing this bill. If we, I mean, if we can, that's the goal, right? But what we're doing is we're taking ownership for as much energy usage as we can. So we're trying to have it under your name and try to use it to increase your property value. But the goal is to take as much ownership of the energy usage as we can. So it sounds like the, the big thing on the fixed rate is, yes, it is a fixed rate. But understand that as your family grows, your energy usage grows. grows. As you buy more things, like as you know, you build a deck on, then you put... You know, if, if I had a deck, I'd put a cold plunge. That's my thing, right? <laughs> you, you might put a pellet grill there that you run all the time or a bug zapper or you might buy an ice machine or any of these things or you might get a pool. Now you have a pool pump. Like these things are going to increase in might get an energy EV. expenditure. Huh? You might get an EV. Yeah, you might get an EV. They're going to increase your energy expenditure. Therefore, the system that you have built out isn't going to be 100% offset for that. That's why we think it's best to educate on like, hey, we're going to give you a little bit of a buffer so you can yep. grow into it for one. Yep. And two... 
if you grow past it, we're still helping you fix that rate from 80 to 90%. And plus 80% at a fixed rate right now is still going to be significantly cheaper than what that electricity bill would have been in five years from now with all the rate increases with energy demand going up and everything, right? So um, maybe they're not getting those instant savings that they were kind of hoping for. If I'm paying $300, $400 in electricity, I'm paying $200 now for my payment. Because of interest rates, because of rate increases and stuff like that, that's not kind of how it was. In 2018 and 2020, it was really easy to get an electric bill replaced with a lower payment, right? But now we're in a transition where we're still replacing it and we're playing a long game a little bit more. We're waiting two, three years before we start seeing the IRR really kick in and really seeing the savings from a month-to-month -month perspective. But year for year, they're definitely there. Okay. Yeah. Um, it really just kind of depends on, number one, how you're explaining it, who your client is, what their concerns are what their electricity usage is and how much space they have on the roof that's not, you know, completely north facing or completely shaded or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, everything's case by case, but we try to do a good job on the education side of things and also to plan for the future. All right. So yeah. there's the 30% tax credit if you're a homeowner investor. That's a really big thing to go for. You've got the fixed rate, whether that's 80% or 100%. You're still going to have some fees from the energy bill for connectivity things. That makes sense. And what was your third reason? Ener energy independence. 100% energy independence. Um, anyone that's getting solar with a battery right now, they don't have to worry about any of these weather issues that are causing, you know, rolling blackouts. Um, sooner or later, as much as I hate to say it, Texas is going to look a lot like California. And I don't mean it in that way, but what I mean by that is because of the weather and everything, there's going to be rolling blackouts happening. And you're already seeing it. Some places are losing electricity within San Antonio just because the grid cannot handle the demand of energy. And that's going to get worse and worse. And the way you really do that, if you want to be the one person in your neighborhood that has power during these times, is you get a battery and you power it with solar panels. So um, Texas is all about independence. If there's any state that screams independence more than anything, it's Texas, right? So um, being independent from a monopoly, which is CPS, which is the you know, utility company, that's a big part of why people are starting to get on the train and really understand how it works. I mean, we have some of the craziest Republican clients that I would never, ever, ever expect to even look in the green energy and they're my happiest clients and stuff. So it's always the big trucks with the no soliciting outside. That's Those are the clients that are the happiest in my opinion. So and That's they get awesome. it they get it easily too. They really get it easily. They All do right. not want to be paying something that they don't want to be paying or they don't have to be paying. Makes sense. Makes sense. So if you're a homeowner or an investor, the big three takeaways of why you should look into solar is because you're gonna get a tax credit. Thirty percent if you're a homeowner could be north of that as a business owner. You're gonna have a fixed rate of eighty to ninety percent of your energy expenditure, and you're gonna have energy independence. That's the difference between renting an apartment and owning a home, correct? Absolutely. You're paying the same mortgage. You're paying the same payment every month, but one's sticking in your name and one's increasing your net worth and one's being flushed on the toilet. Awesome. Well, I wanted to talk to you more about, you know, if I was a sales rep, where I should look to go work. I think we can save that for another podcast in the future. Yeah. Um, but I did want to leave with some kind of note. Like if you're your story at the beginning is really touching, I think that'll help a lot of people understand that anybody can do this. You know, our, your upbringing yeah. really... And I don't want to sound success. like I've like figured it out or like I've made it or anything. I know like being on a podcast, it might seem that way. My main goal is like, I've learned a lot in my last two, two and a half years being in this industry. Um, and there's a lot of young cats coming in, a lot of people my age, a lot of people younger than me that are coming into this industry. If I can help minimize that learning gap just by a little bit, by sharing some experiences, by sharing some things that I've learned along these lines, I wish somebody would have done that for me. And I learned everything that I learned from YouTube and stuff like that. So the goal for this is to be able to Anything that I'm learning right now, anything that I'm confident Not conf in yeah. sharing, anything I'm confident in sharing, right? That's the number one thing because you see a lot of people just talk about a lot of things and that's kind of not that's not what we want to do right so i think that's a blanket disclaimer for both of us it's like <laughs> hey hey um we're this, on a podcast we're, we're not not saying that i know everything in fact i would tell you i'm far from knowing everything but that yeah. was half the reason for starting the podcast is it gives you an opening to talk about what we do know a chance to educate people on the things that we do know make it public and easier to find but also have a forum to talk to people that know more than us and yeah. share that with everybody and ourselves so that we can continue to get better and the people that do follow this can get a little bit better as yeah well. absolutely and just even the same reason why you said we started the podcast was the same reason why i started trying it at such a young age too right it was really because i wanted to learn while i grew my business i mean there's two options you could have gone when opening a business you can start early on make your mistakes learn from there and kind of expect that the learning curve or you can go to a different company kind of work your way up through the chains kind of learn the behind the scenes and everything and then leave to go do your own thing for More us, it just happened to, <laughs> we have both experiences, right? So for me, it was mainly just like, okay, we're doing the podcast because we're continuously learning. It forces us to continue to learn and also to be able to 
uh, teach other people. And I think one of the best ways you learn something is by teaching somebody else. That's the way something sticks with you, right? If you can actually teach somebody else, that's how you know you know something or you know your shit, right? So um, a big also, part of that is... I look at it as part of the three prongs, man. It's good for the community. It will tell everybody that what we do know. And you yeah. know what? We're going to be wrong. Yeah. We're not I'm, I'm very open to being wrong. I hope I am wrong because that just means I'm going to learn something. Uh, I don't. I don't hope. I don't, <laughs> uh, disclaimer. Disclaimer. Like, no, no, I hope I'm wrong because like being wrong implies that there's something to learn. Yeah. And it, I was mistaken about something that I won't be mistaken about again once I'm proven wrong. That's true. So That's I think true. there's good things. But you know, for my last question, for those inspired by your story and the things that they were able to learn today, what would you tell a new entrepreneur going into the clean energy space? First of all, congratulations for entering a really, really cool space early on. I think clean energy is not being talked about. I don't think energy is talked about nearly enough, but clean energy, let alone. Um, so congratulations on that end. And the one thing I'll tell you is just be a sponge, continue to learn from as many people as you can. I mean, learn with a grain of salt, take everything with a grain of salt, but also try to learn something from everybody if you can. Um, I've had, I don't, I don't, I haven't had any like direct mentors or anything, but I've been able to use communication skills, people skills, whatever, make really good connections with genuine people in this industry as many scumbags that there are there also are good people and learn from them and uh don't be afraid to communicate anything don't be afraid to ask questions i guess stuff like that that's like the biggest takeaway that i would have and just believe in yourself that's number one thing too i mean we wouldn't be here if there was no belief in either of us and i believe in you you believe in me but we believe in each other as well too which is a huge thing so um as cliche as it sounds like anyone can do it i see solar ceos that don't know anything about this industry whatsoever and they're making banks so i'm just like okay you know what if i can if they i just see it as an opportunity where it's so new it's so it's a really new industry and just because it's so untapped right now they're gonna have a lot of people coming in and trying to make an impact right so we're gonna try to be one of them i would we're also add i mean like don't go into business expecting to make a profit very soon like be okay with making nothing for oh. a good chunk of time yeah like. no i i uh, that was okay so maybe one thing i would tell an entrepreneur in this industry <laughs> is uh make sure you have a simple couple of your ducks lined up because it was a really really tough start at 22 i did not know anything about personal finances or about business taxes or anything like that so don't make those mistakes that i did oh get a good fucking account and step number one is <laughs> Get a good fucking account, and if you get that, you'll you'll take care of everything else. So, good and if accountant. you know one, let me know because I'm trying to find one right now too. So, good accountant, good attorney, good mentor. I think, and good business partner. Really That's a big ones. one too. If you find a good business partner, someone that like really understands what you're good at and can compliment you on these other things that you're not good at, that's. Because you can also learn from them and you can also teach them as well too. I think that's one of the best things that you can do. So, uh, don't be afraid to get a partnership. Don't be afraid to. The, I'll, before we go, I just want to share the one story real quick about how we even came. I've known Caleb since February or March 2023. It was, some, it was this year. And the reason I met it was because Caleb loves making content and he was working with Bondoc at the time. And he sponsored his only sponsored ad on Instagram. <laughs> only sponsored ad on Instagram. He paid like 10 bucks, whatever the amount was, whatever the thing is. And I, it came up on my feed and it was him on a roof going, yoo-hoo. And then the camera <laughs> went on him. And I was like, oh, this guy's got swag, dude. And he's doing roofing. Let me talk to him. And he seemed like a nice guy. So um, I slid into his DMs and I was like, hey, you know, you're roofing. I'm in solar. We're both young. We're both hustling. Let's get coffee. Talk like talk strategy. A couple of those, after a couple of those, a couple of meetings in the library, we came up with, I mean, I've always wanted to do the roofing division with Trident. And after our conversations, it just felt like such a no-brainer on bringing you in as a partner and just having everything kind of come together. And they're so synonymous with each other. So, yeah, that was it's crazy how life works sometimes. I think so. it is crazy. I mean, uh, and I think that's that's the universe telling tell me, me something. Tell me that this is where I would have been, you know, one year ago from even today. I would tell <laughs> Who you Who the that fuck is this brown guy, huh? You're crazy. It's not even <laughs> just that. It, it's, I wouldn't... I wouldn't have in a million years thought yeah. I'd own a roofing company. I, yeah. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I knew that was going to be a part of me. I was hesitant to get into roofing because, I, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, and we can talk about that on another day. But ultimately, when it came down to, like, go work for somebody else or start your own company, and then it's like, what should you start your own company in? Well, if I've done roofing for X amount of time. I have all this experience. Why wouldn't I go this direction, right? So crazy how the world works out, huh? Right, cheers to that, man. I mean, a lot of bullshit you got to go through. I mean, it's okay because I've... I've learned a lot in my last two years and I feel like I was in a position to where I could reach out and kind of ask for that help and also pick your brain a little bit and that's why things led to one another right so just 
have faith in yourself, have faith in God, have faith in the universe, have faith in everything, and hopefully things work out. I mean, we're trying to figure it out right now. I'm not going to talk like we made it or anything. Like, yeah, no, not still, or nothing, still figuring it out. Still trying to figure it out. I mean, we've had success, obviously, but not obviously. We've had success, and we're proud of it, and we're th- humble, minimum. but no. minimum success, but... It's it's about growing and it's about learning and it's about continuing to play the long game. And if all the conversations we've had, you know, one thousand percent where my head's at. It's always around the long game. It's so the long game, and and you know, part of that is building a brand and getting yourself out there. And hence the reason we have a podcast. Even though I'm not a multi million dollar millionaire, I am not some kind of guru success dude. Like we just started this company not too long ago. I wish I could be Ty Lopez. Ultimately, this would be a really cool journey to go through with everybody, share our trials and tribulations, and. That's why Look we're back here. on it in 10 years and be like, yeah, that's how we started. Correct. Look at where we are now. Anyhow, if you liked or learned anything, please like and subscribe. Share it to a friend. It helps us out a ton. Thanks for joining Trident Talk. Thank you, guys.